Sledge, we back, baby. We're back, baby. Let's you're going. It. You're going sleeveless with the shirt under. Like, look, I think I offended some people last week with just the cutoff, so I'm just going to ease into it this week with a little women belong in sports, as we all know. With a, with just, I don't want to show off everything. The guns were a little were a little lethal last time out, so we'll just calm it down a bit. Yeah, coming out episode two like that is a little too strong. Let's slow it down. Let's slow it's it down. Been, it's kind of been my mo for my whole career. Like I just come in with with some force. Touch and go, baby. One Touch speed, go, baby. all go. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Sledge, I'm going to start right. it off right here because this okay. is something that I'm kind of, I'm not kind of, I'm really passionate about. The hometown team here, the Miami Marlins. Yeah, I have yeah. a big family down here. I got a lot of cousins, a lot of nieces, nephews, a lot of, a lot of kids, a lot of people down here that follow all of Miami sports. Heat, Dolphins, Marlins. Yeah. By the way, that's a great the manager of the Spolstra, the McDaniels, and Skip. I mean, those are great figures to look up to managing-wise for this city. I can sniff something out now. I feel like I know something is not right with this situation. And again, we're not going to cross that line of trying to be people that are leaking stuff out, people that are trying to find out this inside information. You and I have both been involved in this game for a long time, and we've gotten to play work with a lot of people that we really look up to. Mm -hmm. Skip is one of those guys. Mm -hmm. When you see all the moves that are being made, when you see the stuff that's being leaked out in the media, when you see Skip giving his press conferences pre and post game, you and I both know Skip, and we can 100% say that something is off there. Correct. And I'm going to go on a little further, and I want to get your opinion on this, but let's date it back to the offseason. The GM, Kim, Kim Ng, gets let go. So a manager, as a manager, you need to have a great relationship with your owner, with your GM, and obviously your staff and players. When Kim gets let go in the offseason, you then, as a manager, I'm sure have a conversation with the owner saying, listen, this isn't right. I don't agree with this move. At some point in time, that conversation is had right when she's let go. And at that point in time, to me, it seems like, okay, we don't agree on this. I'm going to leave you. We don't want you here. So that option of skip then gets declined or whatever it is. But we now wait to leak that option being declined when the team starts two and 10. And we're going to leak that out in April. Right. So for me, the last straw was seeing Max Meyer, the kids up here. He's got two wins, beat the Braves, which was a huge, huge win for the Marlins. And then he gets optioned down. Yeah. So for me, seeing skip answer those questions in the media knowing damn well he did not want this move to happen. He knows that he can't let the players know that because if the players feel that, then the, the energy, everything right. is not going towards winning. So in my opinion, and I'll let you go on this, there's mm. something that's going on there that doesn't seem right. I, you, you're 100% right. And it just feels like Skip's being used as a scapegoat at this point. And uh, it's, it's really, really unfortunate. And just I happen to see his press conference asking questions about sending Maya down and it just made no sense to anybody even if you are sure he wasn't meant to start the season there you've had to deal with injuries I understand that but he has arguably been your best pitcher and when you get off to this kind of start you need all the help you can get if he happens to stay for these next three weeks or a month and pitches and gets to a pitch limit maybe he gets to 45 innings whatever it is then you send him down You've got your dudes coming back. You're able to make those adjustments to the rotation. It just didn't make any sense. And watching him try to word salad, word soup his way through an answer to that question made me feel like he's kind of at the point where he's like, I've lost my ally in the front office. It's me against everybody up there, it feels like. And I'm trying to keep this, this team who I took to the playoffs last year heading in the right direction. And and it's not going anywhere close to that. And I just feel for Skip right now, for sure. Yeah, and how are you supposed to compete against the Braves, the Phillies, the Mets, even so to speak, in that division when there's that kind of disconnect? When you play with somebody in a full season, when someone is your coach, you are with these people 24-7. You're with them at the field, and then a good chance away from the field, you're spending a lot of time as well. There are so many conversations on situations like this Max Meyer deal where – I've heard it from Skip. Like, this isn't the first time this has happened. Mm. You can plan this stuff out. If you have plans that this kid is going to be in the big leagues for your team, you can map this schedule out to where he doesn't have to be, you know, 
in the minor leagues, throwing three innings at a time. At the end of the day, you want him under your supervision at all mm-hmm. times if you're the big league manager because this is a guy you're going to build in the future for. So exactly. for me, that's where it's like, no, this is this is something that's going on. And to me, in our game right now, this is something that's happening a lot is you have a lot of GMs that really want control. They want so much control that they will go out and hire somebody to be their manager, knowing okay. damn well that they can fully control what goes on in that dugout. Exactly. Yeah. So to me, this is where I'm I'm nervous for my hometown team, and I think stuff is going to get a little dicey because Skip Schumacher is not the type of person that's going to do that. He's no. going to tell you to go yourself, yeah. and he knows damn well how good of a manager he is, mm-hmm. and he's not scared to go out on the open market because he's going to get swooped up, and he's going to go to a place where they want to win, and he deserves that. Every single year, there's at least a couple of managerial openings. And if you're looking at filling that role and whatever we think is going to go down goes down with Skip, you would be mad not to hire him based on everything I know about him and what I've seen as him as a manager so far. I tip my hat to Skip because you don't yeah. see not one player, not one staff member. Those guys are going out every single night trying to win, doing everything they can. I'm sure they know and they have a good idea of what's going on. But the way that Skip's been able to keep that clubhouse focused and try to win baseball games is the reason why we need more managers like Skip Shoemaker in this game. Exactly. And especially when you look at the offseason they had, they did nothing in the offseason. And it's just like, as a manager, you are trying to sell the fact that you're going out there every night to do exactly that, to try and win. But it just speaks to a larger problem that it feels like there may be a few clubs that are not focused on winning and are focused on other things, which we all know. It's always been that way. Yeah, and and let me ask you this. Do you think as a baseball fan, I have this weird thought now as a baseball fan, and I get it. There's certain certain players that have big contracts that fans know about, and you expect a certain certain amount of production from those players. But as a Marlin fan, you don't, and I could be wrong because I'm not really deep diving into this, but why don't you talk about a team that made the playoffs last year? You let right. Soler go. You let John Birdie go, who obviously he's not one of your superstars, but at the same time, he's the guy that's keeping all that together. He's the guy that can play every position. You trade him a day before spring training ends, all that type of stuff. But in my opinion, how do you not talk about the team making the playoffs, trying to add on that? I think a lot of fans now get brainwashed in the wrong stuff as far as the contracts, the negotiations, and that type of stuff. Like a guy like Tommy Pham, why do you care if he's making three or four million dollars? You should just be happy your team signed him. He's a good player. Well, you guys are to blame. You guys, the Royals are the ones that showed the showed the way to do it. You draft, you build. Every fan wants to spend no money and to have the, the 2014-15 Royals roll up and, and go to back-to-back World Series. But it's just not that easy. And unfortunately, there's a ton of good players out there right now that are just sitting at home, and it sucks. Yeah, but like, but but as a fan, why do you care about what the money spent? It's not your money. Why do you exactly. care? You know what I mean? I know. That's where there's... There's a lot of there's a lot of general managers out there that I really do feel for because you are under these limits of obviously there's no salary cap but yes you have handcuffs on moves you can make moves you can make. There are a select few jobs out there where you can truly go out there and try and get the best players to win. I mean, Peter Seiler rest his soul in San Diego as mm-hmm. an owner, this dude was an absolute savage. He was going out there telling the GMA, hey, "Go get whoever you need to get." I will sign off on that check. And they did it. And man, you see what, yeah, and you see what that did to San Diego. That brought, I mean, they went ahead and shipped your boy out of there. And then all of a sudden, everybody, <laughs> that place was electric. You know what I mean? They finally got me out of there and the place was electric. The but I just feel like that's what our game, not getting me out of there, but our game needs to get right. back to, hey, we're going and getting the best players. And this is what it can do to a city because that place is electric now. It's an electric atmosphere. You guys are making billions. Let's spend some millions. Let's go. It's not that hard. Come on. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Hey. That's a great point. Arguably, the biggest story of the week has been the news that's come out with this Shohei stuff, the gambling nonsense, that the numbers that I've seen this week are just frightening. Like, I had absolutely no idea. When I heard $5 million, I thought, ah, oh, that's, you know, like, that's a big number, obviously, but it's not out of the question. We're talking $142 million in losses. Sorry, that's his wins. And $182 million in losses. $182 million. 
I mean, I have so many questions. I have so many questions. First of all, how do you bet that much money on what you're betting every single sport that's having a game at some point in time throughout the day? Czechoslovakian women's handball competition at 2 a.m. He's throwing a milli on that shit. 182.9 million at a net loss of 40 million on the side while translating for the best player, the most recognizable baseball player at this time. It's coming out of his account and he doesn't know. Which is insane to me, man. It's insane because these guys spend so much time together. And again, like, I feel like there's so many more questions that are going to be answered that will kind of you know, give everybody a, an idea, more of an idea of what's happening. But, you know, it, it's something to me that like, again, this is another thing that's kind of taking away from our game. We have our best player that's in our game is going to Korea to open the season against the Padres yeah. who have a player from that hometown in Korea. And it's like, all right, we're two wings, two innings into the game. And all of a sudden, boom, we hear about this betting scandal. And to me, it's like, man, how do you begin to bet that much money? Like, do you just say, all right, I think I can bet, you know, 100,000, 200,000 on this game. I can get a little pocket change for myself. Shohei's not going to know about this. Right. And then do you lose that first bet and you're trying to keep getting it back? And then all of a sudden you dig into a 150, whatever million dollar hole. Like, it's, how does that happen? It's, it's obviously clearly an addiction thing. But I like, I want to ask you a question because I don't know what it's like to even be close to the kind of money that you guys have made, right? I have a platinum Amex. Amex my bad. I get a Sorry notification <laughs> every single time my wife buys something from Target, it flashes up on my phone. Are you telling me he's making these size bets and Shohei doesn't get a notification saying uh, $7.8 million has just left your account? He has to be getting that. I'm going to tell you a funny story about Hassan Kim in uh in new york okay so we're we're with the pods we're in new york one day we have an off day manny machado is a big time louis vuitton client they send him a lot of things he's bought a lot of things they have a great relationships we have an off day in new york manny machado doing a show thing per usual shuts down the whole entire louis vuitton store the team gets to go in there gets to shop gets to get whatever we got to get all that type of thing it was pretty sweet so we go in there Hassan Kim buys a $28,000 satchel. It's one of those like crocodile looking skin ones where it's all black. $28,000 satchel. And his translator, Leo Bay, who I love Leo Bay, and I have confronted him about this. So this is all in good fun. So we get on the bus. We're riding to City Field. And all of a sudden, Kim gets a, a call from his sister. And his sister is like, what the hell are you doing? And he's like, you know, whoa, 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 what do we got? What do we got? She's like, you just spent X amount of dollars at the Louis Vuitton store. You bought some satchel for $28,000. Like, what the hell is going on over there? So point being, he spent a lot of money at the Louis Vuitton store. Obviously got a lot of notifications for his bank account, his financial advisor, whoever it is. But yep. they let him know instantly right then and there. So for this dude to do what he did, I mean, this scheme that he was up to, was so high level and i hate to even say that because i feel so bad for shohei if this is all true right. but that just proves to you all the stuff he was doing that just makes this terrible if this is all true well it's come out this week that shohei handed his phone into authorities they found absolutely no evidence of any even kind of communication there was no instigation from shohei as far as they're concerned this is all on ippy and if that's all on him i mean he's looking at 30 years right now, 30 years, 19,000 bets, hoes. That's insane, man. And I saw the one thing too about the bookie saw Shohei walking his dog and was like, hey, I'm going to go up to him. I need you to respond to me. And I will say this, man, either way, like right or wrong. And I think a lot of people in the beginning when this story came out was like, all right, something's something off. made right here. This is Shohei covering up, whatever. So now to fast forward, we're getting a lot more evidence. It's looking a lot better as far as like Shohei had nothing to do with this. But either way, this causes such a big distraction because you're yeah. going to have those half of people that are like, nah, that's that Shohei. He's covering this up. So that just proves to you what kind of distraction this all is. As far as moving on from it and dealing with it, Shohei's doing a great job right now. But you just hope for our game that. It was nothing to do with him and this yeah. Ipe guy, man. He got away with he got away with a lot if this is the case, but he's gonna have to pay for it now. 
For sure, he's going to pay for it somehow. And, oh, by the way, the distraction, he just tied Hideki Matsui for most home runs for a Japanese-born player with 175. I, I have a feeling, I'm not a betting man, but I feel like he might break it. I mean, <laughs> there is a good chance, and that's a lot of homers, man. I, I feel like he just got to the league a couple of years ago, and there's been a couple injuries and you know early on in L.A., so to him – to reach that, like I felt like Hideki Matsui was in the league for ten years with the Yankees, like just crushing homers. So, yeah, he's on a way of of doing stuff in our game that, and he's unlocked new stuff in our game as far yeah. as how they look at two way players now, because that was frowned upon back in the day. Like you had Josh Hamilton, who everyone talked about. Oh, he could have threw like ninety six on the mound, but that Adam wasn't like a too. real. Yeah, Rick Ankiel. There's a lot of guys to where like. They could have possibly been two-way players, but it wasn't even thought about. And now mm -hmm. he's opened that opportunity for like kids at university. This kid at the University of Florida uh, hitting 520-foot homers, throwing 99 miles an hour off the mound. Yeah. He's gave more opportunities for these kids to make that two-way thing a real, a realistic thought. I also think that obviously it's one thing to do it in college, but for him to be at a translator and do it at the best level in history is is just mind blowing to me. Speaking of RBIs. Juan Soto. This is a great uh, old school versus new school stats right. versus yeah. whatever. You know what I mean? So RBIs, people will say that they consider RBIs a slightly lucky stat. Okay. I disagree. I think if you drive in runs, you drive in runs, you have a knack for that. I, I will combat that and understand. I think there should be some kind of percentage. If you have... Juan Soto as a hitter, and he's got a guy on third with less than two outs. He yeah. drives the run in 88% of the time. I want to yeah. know that information. Love that. But, like, to me, yeah, you can't say RBI is a lucky stat. This dude's right. driving in 500 runs. That's incredible. Look at the other names on the list, by the way. So he's the fourth youngest to do it behind Miggy, Pujols, Andrew Jones. The other three guys on that list behind him are Griffey, A-Rod, and Beltre. So we're talking about the elite of the elite over the last 25 years in our game. Nothing lucky about that list at all. Nothing lucky. Nothing. Uh, Nothing. What is lucky, and I think you need to touch on this, how would you feel stepping in the box and having Nesta Cortez come at you with the pump fake? I mean, <laughs> I would feel the same way playing first base defensively for Nestor if I saw him doing this. And let me be clear on this. Super on Nestor. What, what a – like – that dude has figured out how he is successful in this game. He's done a great job of doing that in New York. He's a dude now. He is a guy in our league that kids, players, everyone want to be like they do that. So Those when I see Nestor do something, yeah, he's got the yeah, he's got the whole look going. He's got a little bit of swag about him with the mustache. He's a Miami dude, so naturally he's going to have swag. But like for me, that's where I'm watching this and I'm like Nestor, you're killing me right now, dog. Because you're going to have every little kid in Hialeah, Miami, all over South Florida, all over the world, pump faking. And I don't know if I'm ready to see that yet. Look, listen, when I first started this game, it was told to me that oh, hitting is about timing. What? Is that a back in the day? Is that a back? No, no, no. <laughs> Did I say that? No, no, no. That okay, was close. Okay, that was okay, close. okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. But it was, hey, man, hitting's about timing. And pitching is about interrupting that timing. There is nothing that's more effective to interrupt timing than you sitting there pump faking. I, I'm happy that it was able to be fouled off, but and acknowledged as a good. It's completely legal, and until they outlaw it, we've got to find some advantages as pitchers. So I'm all in. You're all in on this. I'm all in on this. Yeah, I wish on I had a pump faker. Good, I had 88 to 90 miles an hour from a sidearm with a little bit of sank and a sweeping slider. If I could have thrown in a pump fake every now and then, I used the quick pitch. I could have thrown a pump fake. I would have been all in, dude. I'm That's so still off right now. I'm so off you. If you would have pump faked that bat that Matt Holiday signed for you, instead of saying that bowling ball sticker, he would be like, Pete, <laughs> it's hard for me to look you in the eyes after you pump faked me. <laughs> different era, Hoss. Dude, it's, it's a so different era. It's a new game, man. We got to we gotta adapt. <laughs> It, <laughs> rule number one in rundowns and pickoffs and relays rundowns don't pump fake when you pump fake the dude over there is moving all type of ways but if you're all in on this oh man i hate that i hate that for fine. you but i right. i accept it i accept okay. it except this i'm gonna give you some numbers right big numbers guy come on i'm a big numbers guy 
Eight innings, 14 punch outs, a .375 whip. Who would I be talking about this year? Someone who's lights out. I can tell lights you that. Lights out. And it's someone by the name Eight of Craig so that's a reliever. Oh, dude. He's still doing it. <laughs> Look up his career numbers. I feel like everyone kind of knows, but like you will be surprised because you're like, oh my God, 400 something saves or he, yep. I mean, it's unbelievable what he, it's unbelievable the career he has. He just got his fourth save this year. I didn't know that he was going to be getting saves this year, but he's already got his fourth. 14 punch out in eight innings, like I said. He's at 421. Kenley Jansen's at 424. They're going to f- finish third and fourth all time on the saves list. And I know this is another one of those recent stats, but I mean, we're witnessing two of the best to ever do it. And I played with Craig in 2010 when he first came up. I was always going to say it, but I didn't. I stopped myself. <laughs> and he was the, the quintessential come up, walk the bases loaded, punch out the side when he first got here. And then all of a sudden, the next year, he became the best closer in baseball and was for about the next five years. So to watch him still be able to do it, and I watched the inning, man. It was f-ing, it was disgusting. Like, it was probably as good as before he would – he was the first one to really get that running backspin, long carry, f- rising fastball. And yes. it was fun to see him and Billy Wagner in the same bullpen in 2010 – Two dudes from both sides coming from their f-ing earlobes and just frizzing it at 100 miles an hour. Like, it was just <laughs> beautiful to watch. And I just want to give a shout-out to Kimbo Slice and Kenley, who are still getting it done 48 years after they started. Yes, and shout-out to Billy Wagner as well, who should be in the Hall of Fame. Will be we in the Hall of Fame. We'll argue that one to because he should be in there. So that's such a big sign, too, because you can speak on this as a reliever the ninth inning is different. I don't know yeah. what it is. There is a different pressure for, for a Sucks. relief pitcher to go and get a save in the ninth inning. Yeah. So you sign him as Baltimore. What a great sign because you lose your closer. You can then just put Craig right there in the ninth inning and these Canoes, all these guys that are in that seven, eight, nine setup Keep role, they don't miss a beat. They stay right there. It's, yes. So that just speaks on how valuable he is. It's a great signing. One year, 12, I think they got him for. Not blowing out the bank. And so far, obviously, well worth the money. So, I mean, just what a great job of scouting and, and now, obviously, free agency that the Orioles have done. They're, they're f- money right now. And that AAA team's still banging. I know. I, I, I would love to see how many RBIs that, um, what was it, Mayo, the one kid down there, he had like 26 <laughs> and he had like eight homers. Uh, so let's stay right there in Baltimore. Let's okay. let's go back to the to Jackson Holiday. So Jackson shot. Holiday, yeah, he he comes up. You know, he's this is the difference right now. And I'm gonna be completely honest about this because I was one of those people that 100 percent thought he should make the team out of spring training. Yeah, and I think sometimes we can get a little too emotional on spring training numbers. I don't think spring training numbers really tell the full story of yeah. spring training because I think you have a lot of pitchers. Like yourself, if you're working on a, a change up that year, you're gonna throw it in spring, all spring, to hope well, that it's gonna be a weapon. And you're never seeing matchups. It's not like you're ever gonna be lining up against the tough lefty in the seventh inning and the eighth inning. It's just whatever they've got sitting out there and whoever's time it is to pitch. Yes. And you're gonna have a scatter report, and his clearly right now is spin. They're throwing him a lot of spin. So when they see that, they throw spin and they have success, they're gonna continue to do that. Yeah. And back in the day, Oh, back in the day, maybe even now, I don't know, because it's been a long time since we've both been in the minor leagues, but there wasn't much information in the minor leagues. So you would go to Lynchburg for three games. They would pitch you a certain way. Then you'd go to Myrtle Beach. They would have a separate scouting report, pitch you a certain way. So you kind of got lucky if the team was missing on the report and weren't yeah. attacking your holes right away. Mm-hmm. So now the big leagues. All the information's out there. You turn the TV on, that information's on MLB Network. It's all out there. So that is the difference. They are going to continue to exploit that hole until he proves that he can either hit it or lay off it. But that is why it is so different. This league is so different, and it's so hard. Yeah. This is not old men yelling at clouds either, but I think there is so much value in having some struggles down in AAA overcoming those because AAA now they are going to make adjustments he would have faced the same thing honestly towards if it was six weeks eight weeks by that eight week mark the world gets around okay how are we getting him out 
breaking balls. So he would have faced that in AAA. He would have learned how to deal with it down then. Give him a September call up this year, and then he bangs next year. He's freaking 17 or whatever. It's come on, like there's no rush on this kid, and you guys are good enough right now. Yeah, and 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 again, like we talked about the family. It's a baseball family. His uncle, his brother, their hitters, their hitting gurus. Like he's gonna know exactly how to make that adjustment. So yeah. there's there's no worry on that end. He doesn't have to go and be the three hole hitter for Baltimore. He can slide in that eight nine hole. He can get big knocks, and then come October when he's feeling it, you move him up in the one or two hole. So yeah. no one's worried about Jackson Holiday. Jackson Holiday is gonna be a stud, and that development side, like we talked about last episode, is the reason he's going to break out of something like this because he knows the adjustments he's got to make. Yeah, and that's I, I want him to succeed. I can't wait to look up in two weeks and go, oh, man, he's hitting 400 with six tanks. Like, I want that to happen for him, and I know it will, just like you do as well, man. Yeah, absolutely. It will. Just stay tuned. We're, we're still all in on Jackson Holiday. Doing no favors for the pitchers or athletes, Carl Freeland pinch run and slides into home play and dislocates his non-throwing shoulder. <laughs> Come on, man. I know. That's I tough. Know, that's a bad, it's a bad rep for you. Yes. I can feel for him because I feel like that's an ambush job. It's like, Hey, for like sure. it's the ninth inning. That guy's on base. Hey, go, go down to the cage real quick. Stretch we out. We you. need we you. Need you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Freeland to me is one of those guys that is balls to the wall. Like he's not going he's to try it. and lay up. Yes. He's going to go in there and he's going to try and if he's got to truck somebody, he's going to do it. If he's got to take out somebody, he's going to do it. And I think the the Good way that tough. that Hoffman the pitcher landed on him, it was kind of awkward. So that yeah. was that was a tough scene for him out there. But man, that's a tough look, man. When you lose one of your starting pitchers in the ninth inning, pinch running like that, that that hurts the team, and they're already going through a lot over there. So that's it's a tough break. I tell you what's not hurting their team or my eyeballs. Fernando Tatis's cleats this year have been Ooh. some of the sickest I've ever seen. I mean, and that's why <laughs> that's why you guys saw me wear my best jacket out there in Arizona when we had him in, right. in Profar come because anything this dude does is stylish. Anything, yep. any kind of dance move he does is cool. Anything he does is set in trends. Except I will say I I will not be okay if Fernando Tatis starts painting his nails. I will not be okay with that. Really? I'm so on everything he does, but if he starts painting the nails, I don't know if I can do that. I got to haul that primo out there in Atlanta because Acuna's doing it now too, and I'm like, but Bro. he's pulling it off. Is he? He's pulling it off, dude. Are you telling me that black nail polish on the cover of that magazine didn't look sick, kind of sick on him? I'm not saying you have to do it, but you telling me it didn't look kind of sick. I'm going to say everything about Acuna. Acuna is sick, but I cannot give him the nail polish. All right, not yet. that's fine. Yeah. That's fair enough. That's I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think about it. I'm not going to close it off. We're going to talk about this next week. I'm coming with my nails. <laughs> my nails painted next week just for this episode. I'm throwing them up. All five. Toenails. You betcha. We're going to be a foot pod next week. So you're pump faking and you're coming with nail polish. I'm, I'm, I'm questioning who I'm doing this podcast with now. I'm questioning it big time. Hey, digging deep this week. We got Cressy coming out, right? Yeah, perfect timing for Cressy too. I mean... Hate to say it, but all the injuries happening. Perfect guy to start picking brains on why is it happening? What's different about the training? What can we fix about it? So that's going to yeah. be a good one for for all the youngsters and even those professional guys to see, which I know a lot of professional guys work out with him throughout the offseason. And Taddy and Profar next week. So make sure you're ready for that with nail polish on. Profar's been in the news. Profar's been making the news a little <laughs> bit lately, huh? Mr. Relevant. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talk about setting the tone for a team. Talk about bringing the type of energy we're talking about. And I don't know if you can quantify it or whatnot, but are you telling me that he did not spark those dudes up to go take two or three in L.A.? Like, you telling me that last game after Will Smith says he's irrelevant, the whole team isn't fired up when he hits that base-clearing double? For are sure. you not on the top step being like, hell yeah. In L.A.? Right? In L.A.? Right? Yeah, that's In sick. L.A.? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, good for him. Good for him, pro. Way to, yeah. way, to, way to respond to that, baby. We don't do that media talking. We'll save that for Pedro and Haas, baby. It's great seeing you again. God, you look good. Stay up.